wrap up this afternoon by again looking ahead to contemplate the future of hunting and wildlife management. We are very, very pleased to have Carter Smith as our concluding speaker. Uh, Carter is the executive director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, a position he's held since January of 2008. He's responsible for overseeing 3,300 professionals in 13 different divisions, including wildlife, law enforcement, state parks, coastal, and inland fisheries. As a wildlife biologist, he, works, he worked on projects across the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. And Carter serves on a plethora of conservation-related boards and advisory councils. I'll be quite honest and transparent. Um, the symposium planning process began with this end in mind. So we wrap up the 17th annual Holt Cat Symposium on Excellence in Ranch Management by asking Carter to look into his crystal ball and give us a glimpse of the future of hunting and wildlife management. Carter? Rick, thank you. Thanks for that very kind and generous introduction. Nice to be with all of you, albeit virtually. I have to say, Rick, I'm mindful that I am the last one standing here in the symposium. And if ever there was a clarion call for brevity, I suspect that is that, that is it. And uh, I'll do my best to kind of honor that. I, I really am delighted to talk about this topic, which is, you know, near and dear to all of us in the outdoor community. And as you noted, I'm really going to be looking at this um, at the macro level, a little bit more of a 30,000 foot level, um, looking at trends largely outside of the fence lines as opposed to inside the fence lines, but ones which undoubtedly have very pronounced impacts for all of us who have some level of responsibility for managing the lands and waters and fish and wildlife that all of us hold so dear. Um, and also my presentation is, is really gonna focus more on kind of the human element, the, the human dimension, the, the social side, the people side, if you will, which is um, so important in the area of wildlife management and, and hunting management. Um, you know, as a point of departure in thinking about these topics and particularly the, 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 the question of the future of hunting, it's, it's impossible to detach oneself from this, you know, str strange, surreal COVID influenced climate that we know is, is, is 2020. And as I've um, said probably too much this year, the only thing good um, to come out of 2020 from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's perspective was the start of dove season. And while I say that out of half in, in jest, um, um, what is serious about it is one of the kind of few silver linings that we have seen in this COVID area and this, this, this pandemic that all of us have had to confront um, as a society. And that has been really the increased utilization of the outdoors and um, the fact that families and individuals are rediscovering the connection with land and water and outdoors. And I realized that, you know, talking to a bunch of ranchers and ranch managers about the value of outdoors is a bit analogous to, you know, bringing coals to Newcastle. But um, what I'm obviously really talking about is the vast majority of us who live in you know, urban areas, cities, towns who have found the outdoors to be the great source of respite and escape and places that have been, you know, critical for people's, you know, mental and emotional welfare and sanity and, and, and well-being. And that's translated not just to, you know, an artesian well of utilization of, you know, parks and green belts and, and trails is, is certainly happening inside cities big and small, but also um, a real resurgence in um, more traditional or conventional outdoor um, related activities, hunting and fishing and boating. And so um, agencies like ours um, all across the country are seeing double digit increases in sales of hunting and fishing licenses over, you know, prior years of, of record, um, increased boating activity. Um, people are getting outdoors and making the, the, the most of it. And, you know, the questions that that obviously generates for those of us who are in the business of helping to um, foster and promote and manage outdoor recreation, um, you know, will those trends continue? 
um, beyond kind of the current COVID environment and a, and a return to whatever the next iteration of a new normal is and looks like. Um, but just as importantly, um, what do we do to make sure that we've adequately positioned ourselves to help maintain these trends going forward and not, not lose them? And when we, we think about the first part of this presentation and this question about the future of hunting, um, you know, it's important to put it in the context in which it exists, um, which is, you know, in some ways a formidable one. Um, you know, 4% of us um, in the United States who are older than 16 hunt. Um, I think all of us are aware that literally for decades, the number of hunters um, has been on some kind of a decline in most of parts of the United States. We, we peaked with the largest number of hunters back in uh, the early 1980s at around 17 million. Um, and the last iteration of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Survey on National Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Associated Recreational Trends um, estimated the number of hunters um, at around 11 and a half million people. Um, now, while certainly admittedly, there are any number of states, including Texas, you know, upwards of 20 to 25 that have seen gross numbers of hunters increase. Um, it's not so much the gross numbers, it's the relative proportion to um, the population increase, which is um, also having a major bearing on these questions of hunting and wildlife management. And so if you really adjust the, the growth in hunter, hunters or hunting in the states where that's happened and account for that against the relative population growth, we really only see four states across the, across the country that have kept pace with population growth in places that uh, perhaps um, are not a surprise, Alabama, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and, and North Dakota. Um, but as we contemplate, you know, how we're going to address, again, this future of this proud outdoor heritage that we, you know, share and love and hold dear, um, it's also important to be reminded, um, you know, what are those underpinnings for the decline? Why aren't as many people getting into the out of doors and enjoying the um, sport and nature of, of hunting? And candidly, they're well documented. And we'll talk a little bit more about those this afternoon. And they relate to, you know, questions and means of access. Um, they relate to the lack of an established mentor inside a family that, you um, can help teach and introduce and inculcate um, a young or older person into the joys in the sport of hunting. Um, the competition for leisure time has never been more intense and more varied, you know, as a parent. And as I think about, you know, when am I going to get my son um, out to the ranch to deer hunt, which he dearly wants to do, you know, how do you balance that with the football games and the baseball games and the basketball games and the school related activities and the birthdays of, um, you know, friends and, and, and so forth. And so it becomes a really difficult juggling act for families with overscheduled kids and where they don't have readily means of access or a member of the family that hasn't hunted in a generation that becomes, again, a particularly formidable proposition to, to, to overcome. Um, but what's really undergirding all of that, and I think has um, the most profound implications for the two questions of, of this presentation about the future of hunting and wildlife management, you know, it really all goes back to these demographic shifts that um, have happened over many decades and that we have not only seen but saw coming and see coming in the future, um, as well as the changing values and lifestyles that have come with people that are living in communities and places that are very detached candidly from the from the outdoors. Um, and so the nature of the demographic trends are certainly not working in our favor and they're not also anything that any of us are realistically going to change. But we're not gonna be able to work successfully within them if we don't fully understand them and understand where opportunities to make a difference are with respect to both of these, these questions. Um, when we think about the, the composition of hunters today, and there's you know, really no other way to say this, but we're, you know, we're not particularly diverse, we're 90% we're white and we're 70% uh, male. 
Um, and we're also grain, we're aging. Um, you know, roughly a third of our hunters are baby boomers. So born sometime between, you know, 1946 and, and 1964. And if you look at the demographics of hunting and the implications of an aging hunter composition database, they're, they're very profound. Um, if we go back to the 90s and we look at that band of, of hunters in the 16 to 44 year age um, cohort um, in the early 90s, you know, roughly 40, 45% of all hunters fell in that category. Um, um, today, I'm, I'm sorry, roughly 71% fell in that category. Um, today, that number is more like 40 or 45%. You go back to the 90s and look at hunters um, over 45, um, it was really 25 to 30%. Today, that number is um, 55 to, to 60%. So the age structure has shifted upwards. And so much like um, some of the issues confronting our um, private lands and the, the aging of landowners, um, you know, particularly when it comes to um, the farming and ranching community and the question about the intergenerational shift of, of, of property with the, um, the baby boomers um, passing on, the same issues really um, confound and affect the, the question about, about hunting. Now, you know, why do we care? And I do think it's important to spend a moment at least um, addressing the question about why we care about the future of hunting. And um, if we do purport to care about the future of this very long standing, proud outdoor heritage, and we place a value or premium on being able to get our kids and their kids um, after that outside and enjoying nature in the outdoors and exposure to lands and waters and farming and ranching and wildlife of plenty, um, hunting is, is obviously an extraordinary portal to be able to experience all of that and to help ensure that people have a substantive connection to the outdoors. And um, in my estimation, also a much more likely propensity um, to be interested in the conservation of the wild things and wild places that are so special to all of us in our, our heritage. The other reality, and it's inescapable, is that, you know, sportsmen pay the bills um, for fisheries and wildlife conservation and really have um, uh, since the 1920s and 1930s with the establishment of the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. And, you know, roughly $3 billion a year is invested back into fisheries and wildlife conservation from hunters and anglers that buy hunting and fishing licenses. Um, you know, the average state fish and wildlife agency budget um, realizes roughly 60% of their funding revenue um, from hunting and angling generated sources of, of, of revenue. And those monies go not only to support the biology and management and enforcement and protection of our game species, our deer, our elk, our turkey, our waterfowl, our bighorn sheep and so forth, um, but also our non-game species um, and our threatened and endangered species. So financially, there's an important implication there. Um, obviously, with you know, every challenge, there's also an opportunity. And um, as I said earlier, we have to be um, thinking about how we work within these well-established, long-established, and, and largely immutable demographic trends about, you know, where are the realistic opportunities to help um, grow or at least maintain um, our hunter base and, and, and interest in the outdoor heritage. And, um, and so, you know, where, where, where do we get that next calf crop, that next band of replacement heifers? And, you know, one place that um, we're starting to look a lot more deeply and closely is at the band of young adults in the early to mid 20s to their early 40s. Um, roughly a third of all hunters today um, didn't grow up hunting as a kid. So we know that we have the ability through the right mentor programs to um, recruit new hunters into the, into the sport. We also know it takes time, um, upwards of three years from the point of initiation or introduction to the point of adoption. 
But what we also know about investing in those young adults that are out of college or out of high school, um, um, that they're likely um, employed, they also have more control over their time as opposed to um, a kid. And we definitely want to continue investing in the pipeline of recruiting youth into, into hunting. But also, um, you know, there's some modicum of discretionary income that can be allocated towards the sport and activities of, of, of hunting. Um, and so what we have found um, really on a couple of fronts um, that one, programs that pair up mentors, established mentors with mentees to help introduce them to hunting through very structured activities over a multi-year period, realize huge amounts of success in terms of ultimately um, hunter adoption and continuation of hunting after that relationship is, is continued. Obviously, the question of scale um, on that in this area is an important one. Um, another similar band of those young adults where we see lots of promise um, is in, you know, what I will, I will call the farmer's market crowd or the locavore community. That group of young adults largely reside in urban areas. They're very health conscious. They're very conservation conscious. They're keenly interested in knowing where their food comes from. They're deeply desirous of having a relationship with the producers that produce um, the food that they put on the table. They're interested in, in healthy lifestyles. Um, they're not averse to hunting and in fact are really intrigued by the notion of hunters supporting conservation um, and are interested in connecting to it because of their connection to food. And so um, essentially what we have seen is many successful programs that are being um, implemented of a field to table type model where um, everybody from uh, chefs to biologists and others are participating in group hunts that help create a community structure and a social structure for people that are interested in this, but candidly really don't have relationships with people uh, that we're getting lots of success from a retention perspective and upwards of 75 to 80% um, in terms of people continuing hunting. So we see promise um, within what are otherwise very formidable demographics. Um, what we also see um, is um, a real shift inside state fish and wildlife agencies um, to be better positioned to help address this issue. Because to be fair, um, this has been a long time coming. This is not a new challenge. There are literally hundreds of programs out there across the country that are designed to try to either recruit or retain or reactivate hunters. Um, what's different is um, a real coordinated strategic national R3 effort, again, recruitment, retention, and reactivation, led by the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports, which has helped to enable um, formalized R3 plans across all of the states. Um, the states are hiring R3 coordinators, whose job really is to wake up every day and go to sleep every night, thinking about how we help to penetrate um, and address these challenges. And we've equipped them with much more sophisticated um, marketing and branding and um, customer outreach related tools that ultimately we think are gonna be more effective as opposed to, again, literally a lots of well-intentioned, well-meaning programs that um, by and large um, were being implemented without measuring um, any level of effectiveness or change in behavior or seeing if people that went on hunting related trips continued those activities after that um, kind of one opportunity was provided. So lots of one and done related things, lots of preaching to the choir with some exceptions, um, you know, like the Becoming an Outdoors Woman program, which has had huge success, or um, here in Texas, the Texas Youth Hunting Program that has done an extraordinary job is implemented by the, the Texas Wildlife Association. Um, the other um, critical part of this puzzle as we think about the future of hunting um, really has to do with the question of how do we improve access? And um, undoubtedly, it's one of the top factors that people say as to why 
um, they either don't hunt or they have no longer continued to hunt, that they can't find a place to hunt or don't know how to find a place to, to hunt. So how we break down those barriers is critical. And it's imperative, of course, that we start with our public lands, um, our national wildlife refuges, and our national forests, our state parks and wildlife management areas on the state side in which we lead by example. And I must say that our um, the current administration and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Secretary of Interior have really placed a premium on helping to facilitate improved access to places like the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, but what must also go along with that is um, a commitment to dedicated funding to help improving trails and roads on public lands throughout our national forests and um, inside the refuges. Um, also ensuring that um, better smartphone friendly digital tools, um, easy reference tools for being able to find access are available to sportsmen. And last but not least, when additions to national wildlife refuges, national forests, national parks are being made, um, that, that, that commitments and provisions for sportsman access are integral in part and parcel of the expectations of the future management. And um, that gets at another challenge um, in this calculus and question about the future of hunting and wildlife management. And that is that, um, many of the new fisheries and wildlife biologists and land managers that are coming into this profession um, are not coming into it um, as hunters or anglers. Um, and so there may not be as advertent to the needs of sportsmen and the importance of ensuring that um, those uses are well reflected and represented in our public lands at the state and federal levels. And one program that I think has shown a lot of promise in terms of helping to introduce agency personnel um, to hunting and the North American model of wildlife conservation and the nexus between um, hunting and conservation in sportsmanship has um, been the Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow program is led by the Max McGraw Institute and again making really important inroads um, for agencies like ours as we help to um, uh, introduce employees that have an influence on um, land and public use and make sure that, again, they have um, important exposure to the importance of the outdoors and specifically hunting and fishing. Um, now, as we think about, again, this question about hunting, um, really none of it means anything unless we are just as committed to the stewardship and management um, of our wildlife so that we have not only flourishing game populations, but also flourishing non-game populations, and that we have very well-managed and diverse wildlife habitats. And as Aldo Leopold um, famously reminded us, um, stewardship takes stewards. And in our country, um, that's a fairly eclectic mix of stewards that again, as we've talked about, are not only um, federal stewards or land stewards or state stewards of parks and wildlife management areas, but also local stewards. But really, most of them are you. Um, most of them are private landowners. They're ranchers, they're farmers, they're land managers. It's um, most of this um, when it comes to the future of our wildlife rests largely on the 60% of the United States that is owned and managed by private landowners. 70% if you just look at the lower 48. If you look up the central fairway of the United States, you know, those numbers really are more like 90, 92, 95% in places like Texas and Kansas and, and elsewhere. Um, but it also has to do with where the habitats are. You know, 80% of our grasslands are found on private lands. Um, three quarters of our wetlands, 50% of our forests, 75% um, of our threatened and endangered species are found on private lands. And certainly by extension, if we look at the 
12,000 species of greatest conservation need is identified in state wildlife action plans across the country. Um, those species that we want to keep common or keep off of the threatened and endangered species list, the vast majority of those are also going to be found on private land. And so um, our relationship and our cooperation um, and the future of wildlife is going to be determined in no small part by how well we work to help collaborate, cooperate with, and incentivize private landowners to manage the wildlife that are held in the public trust. Um, and so it's really against the backdrop of two things um, that we think about this big overarching question of the future of wildlife management in our country. And the first one, of course, is the future of the private lands. The second one is against the backdrop of the demographic and societal shift that we have already touched upon. And um, it's the same one that's affecting um, the number of hunters or the lack thereof um, inside the United States. Um, but it's the same shifts and the same societal um, changes in values and so forth that have such a profound impact influence on people's attitudes towards wildlife and the influence on wildlife management and policy. Now, before we talk a little bit about both of those um, things, you know, what are those big issues? Um, as Rick said, looking out as a soothsayer on the crystal ball, crystal ball about um, um, the future of, of, of wildlife. And um, perhaps one of the best places to look is a, is a report that was issued by the America's Wildlife Conservation Partners called the Wildlife for the 21st Century. And the America's Wildlife Conservation Partners, or AWCP, um, is comprised of several dozen of the country's leading um, sportsmen, conservation, wildlife, uh, trade association groups, everybody from the Boone and Crockett to uh, landowner groups like the Texas Wildlife Associations and the Dallas Safari Club and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and so forth. But the big, most salient issues that the, that the partners, AWC partners, identified as we think about the future of wildlife um, in this backdrop of, of private lands and the big societal shifts that we're contending with are, are these. Um, um, the first is sustainable funding, dedicated funding for wildlife. How do we make sure that we continue to invest in the nature of wildlife in stewardship, in management, in conservation on both public and private lands? And how does that persist in ways, again, that are sustainable and viable across administrations? Uh, the questions of sportsman access, again, loom large for the fish and wildlife and conservation related communities as, you know, we see this inextricable linkage of people who use and enjoy the outdoors are also the ones that are oftentimes the most connected, invested to helping to um, their stewardship and their future. Um, big game corridors and the migration um, you know, of elk and mule deer and pronghorn and so forth um, out west, um, which is so important in both the public-private land interface um, in our western states. Um, responsible energy development, not only of a conventional kind, but also um, on the renewable front, which continues to grow and gain traction. How do we make sure that appropriate wildlife-related considerations and siting considerations are appropriately integrated into planning for um, all kinds of energy development that are um, occurring across our country? Um, what kind of changes are needed inside the Endangered Species Act, both from a policy perspective, but also an implementation and an application and a recovery? How do we invest more um, opportunity to partner, of course, with private landowners in recovery? How do we make that more viable? How do we make it more attractive? How do we incentivize it? How do we engage the states in ways that are more meaningful? How do we, if we ever, can put the genie back in the model bottle or shift back to a model of federal land management um, and endangered species recovery that is 
um, not as overwhelmingly directed by litigation as it is to applied management and um, more pragmatic, responsible, on the ground related solutions. How do we manage disease related um, threats that are important to both livestock producers and wildlife? You know, whether it's um, brucellosis out west or fever ticks in South Texas or chronic wasting disease um, across the U.S. and Canada. All of these issues um, are salient ones for us in the fish and wildlife community. And they're also ones that are going to be heavily um, influenced by what happens on our private lands and also what is happening um, with this demographic shift. Um, clearly, again, um, we can't overemphasize the fact that if we're going to be able to successfully manage it, any kind of a reasonable scale, if we're going to be successful in managing things from, again, um, invasive and exotic species and big game corridors and wildlife disease related threats that has got to be through voluntary collaborative partnerships with private landowners and investments um, in our federal and state programs that help to facilitate that whether it's the um, the biggest one the farm bill of course and the six billion dollars a year that goes back into conservation on private lands or more specific um, programs tailored for things like wetlands through the North American Wetland Conservation Act, they have got to continue to be made more landowner friendly rather than less um, if we're going to be successful in our wildlife management related goals. The same is true, of course, for state fish and wildlife agencies. And I um, am pleased to say that, you know, in the 13 years of um, I've been doing this job in Texas and looking at the relationships of state fish and wildlife agencies across the country that a real paradigm shift, I think, is happening across the country and a recognition that state fish and wildlife agencies need to be directing more of their resources and energy and efforts towards enabling and empowering and investing in private lands conservation um, as opposed to just public lands. And we're starting to see lots of positive momentum in that regard. The flip side of this, again, as to how these questions play out um, are on private lands, but also um, within, again, this broader social context and this underlying demographic shift um, and how changes in residency and values have such a profound impact on the future of the management of wildlife that we're all responsible for dealing with. And um, we start to see the real evidence and manifestation of tension, if not outright conflicts, when we get down to the nitty, nitty gritty of things like um, lethal control of wildlife or, you know, delisting of the gray wolf and opening up um, gray wolf seasons again in Wisconsin, you know, threatened and endangered species issues, questions of climate related policy, you know, the management of wildfires in forests out, out, out west. Um, all of these things where the rubber hits the road start to really surface um, tensions that we have in values between um, people that are further removed from where much of the actual management takes place. Um, these social trends and demographic trends, I think, have been very well articulated by um, researchers at, at, at Colorado State who have long studied the wildlife value orientations of the United States and, um, and have given us probably the most contemporary examination of the social context, the human dimension, if you will, of wildlife management and looking at the long-term um, societal trends and how they influence management and policy. And what they found as we've looked, as I've looked at the population across the U.S. is that you can kind of stratify everybody into kind of four different areas. And um, increasingly, um, the one that is growing the most is the category that they call the mutualists, of which, you know, roughly 35% of the population um, is generally affiliated with. You know, mutualists um, are ones that tend to look at wildlife and animals more on an equal social plane. They, they consider them more of their uh, social network. They tend to be a little more anthropomorphic in terms of um, imputing values to 
animals. They're, they're interested more in non-consumptive things, preservationist type attitudes, um, non, uh, again, consumptive related ways to use and enjoy wildlife. They also um, have very little connection to state fish and wildlife agencies like ours. Um, traditionalists, um, on the on the other hand, um, you know, people that tend to be more farmers, ranchers, hunters, anglers, trappers, people that um, have historically utilized and enjoyed the outdoors um, and really think about fish and wildlife, not only for their own intrinsic value, but also candidly for the use and enjoyment that they give people and want to see them sustainably managed in ways that continue to provide those values. Um, and so um, the traditionalists, which, you know, comprise roughly 28% of the population, you know, tend to orient around things that, that again, um, are more supportive of private property rights and the uh, um, proactive and applied management of, of, of wildlife, um, more supportive of lethal control of wildlife and giving landowners more options um, in order to, 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 to manage wildlife. Um, another roughly 20% of the population falls in that category that are defined as pluralists, um, people that um, are more context um, dependent as to whether or not they adopt a more kind of traditional or utilitarian view on wildlife or one that's more mutualistic. And the last category, the 15% of the country are the distanced ones and the ones that um, really are so far removed from thinking about wildlife, it's just not on their radar screen. So they're very detached from the, from the issues of the day. And the core finding really of the Colorado State researchers is that, that this demographic shift uh, that, that's happened over decades, the urbanization, the modernization has had a profound influence and will continue to on the policies and management of our wildlife that take place, you know, not only on uh, public lands, but also largely on, on private lands. And it's defined really by um, this trend of an increase in mutualist tendencies across the United States and a decline in traditionalist orientations. And those changes are perhaps most particularly acute um, in states like Montana and Arizona in California, but we also see surprisingly high number of people who affiliate themselves as mutualists in places like Florida and even Texas. Um, in states with high numbers or high percentages of mutualists, um, perhaps not surprisingly, we also see declining hunter numbers. Um, we also see um, declining levels of trust in state fish and wildlife agencies. And as you look at public trust for state fish and wildlife agencies and compare it to other state agencies or the federal government or other forms of government, traditionally state fish and wildlife agencies across the country have ranked very high in terms of public trust and confidence. But in states with either high or growing levels of mutualists, we see that, that, that trust start to erode. Um, and one reason is, of course, because, you know, mutualists don't really see themselves um, represented inside state fish and wildlife agencies that have largely been oriented towards hunting and fishing related cultures and activities. Um, similarly, as state fish and wildlife agencies um, confront the reality of, you know, very changing demographics inside their states and try to adopt new programs and ways to engage people with more mutualist tendencies. The historic traditional constituencies that have supported the Fish and Wildlife Agency start to become skeptical of the state Fish and Wildlife Agencies and those programs and activities and feel like that um, they're beginning to drift in ways that are no longer serving their, their needs. And so all of this draws us to the really inescapable conclusion that you know, wildlife policy and management um, as we look to the, the future is going to get harder and not easier. And it's going to be influenced um, by people with um, less of a orientation or a grounding in more traditional perspectives. And so like the matter of the future of hunting, um, the future of wildlife management is going to be is determined um, 
every bit as much by how we can effectively manage people is how we can effectively manage wildlife. And to sum it up and borrow a phrase from Robert Penn Warren, um, that's increasingly probably not going to look like anything like Easter week in another. Um, and so um, as we work together to confront the, the demographic changes and social changes that are having such profound influences on our wildlife and hunting, um, agencies like ours can never lose sight of the fact that where the rubber hits the road is going to be where the raindrops fall and where the plants and animals um, are found and where our hunters and anglers go, and that is in our country largely on private lands. And continuing to maintain those connections and the collaboration and the partnership are going to be absolutely essential as we navigate through what undoubtedly are going to be very challenging times. Um, Rick, I'm grateful for the chance to be able to share a few words with this, this audience and, and very grateful for what um, you and Clay and the whole team at the King Ranch Institute do for um, our livestock producers and our ranch managers um, and our managers of our fish and wildlife uh, populations um, across Texas and across the, the whole country and grateful for, for your work and outreach and appreciate the chance to, to be with y'all today. Yeah, thanks, Carter. And uh, you did exactly what we had hoped you would do, give us that 30,000 uh, foot view. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in. I think I can put those two together, uh, the two or three together. And the comment is, with Texas being over 90% private land, what would be your number one encouragement to private property owners um, as to how they could go about helping the public understand the importance of stewarding conservation? You know, it's a, it's a great question, and I think it's one of the most important ones that we, that we have. And I think it's important, critically important, that as our, you know, private landowners are, are, are managing their lands, their waters, their habitats, you know, their wildlife, they're also mindful of the fact that they're also generating these huge amounts of public values that are found on those private lands. The open space, the wildlife habitat, the water quality, the habitats for you know, rare and imperiled species, the rural character of our communities. And um, our private landowners that are thinking about how best to not only steward those assets and those resources that are found on their property, but also can help us communicate the value that um, activities and that stewardship has to the values that I think um, most of the public care deeply about and every survey tells us that they still do is going to be I think enormously beneficial Rick is to is to how we continue to maintain what is still candidly a large amount of public support for wildlife conservation and management on, on, on private lands and so the landowners that can serve as effective ambassadors and communicate and who are willing to show up and help talk about those public values that are largely found on private lands in a state that's proudly owned and managed by 95% of our landowners like in Texas, um, I think is going to be um, essential to helping to, to, to bridge that gap and in some cases the divide that we confront now and into the future. Well, great answer, Carter, and thanks again for joining us and providing a great wrap-up, and thanks for the job that you do leading the 3,300 Texas Parks and Wildlife employees and for what you and your staff do for uh, recreational experiences, conservation, and management in this great state of Texas. So thanks a bunch to you for being thanks, our Rick. speaker. Thanks, Rick.